Good morning, everybody, ladies and gentlemen, children of all ages. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for coming today uh, to uh, join with me in welcoming uh, Professor Mariah Zeisberg from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. And Professor Zeisberg uh, holds a PhD from Princeton University. Uh, she is also uh, held, was part of the political theory project at Brown University and has held a fellowship in the law school at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, Professor Zeisberg is uh, most recently the author of War Powers, and now I'm going to completely blank on what comes after the colon. The Politics of Constitutional Authority. The Politics of Constitutional Authority. Sorry about that. Uh, and so we're uh, uh, very Pleased and proud to welcome you here today to the University of Ottawa, and uh, uh, please uh, join us in welcoming Professor Zeisberg. Thank you, Naomi and Professor Lazar. I'm so happy to be here, um, this interesting audience, and present this this research. I'm really uh, looking forward to this exchange. Is this all right? Is it too? Is it okay? All right. Uh, so my area, um, broadly, I work in U.S. constitutional politics and legal theory. And I'm interested in the kinds of challenges that subjectivity and pluralism can pose to um, legal ideas about authority, and especially uh, legal ideas about the necessity of determinacy for achieving constitutional authority. So I'm just going to give that kind of broad umbrella, because this is focused on U.S. constitutional practice, but I'd be interested in our, in our conversation to talk some about the translation of this into, um, into other contexts, if there are thoughts on that. Um, Okay, so this is this is just a presentation, basically, of some of the of some of the work in the in the book that I just published. Um, in early 2012, Qaddafi suppressing of uprisings in Libya um, began to create concern domestically and abroad, and attention in the United States began to focus on what the United States a U.S. response would be. When the UN Security Council adopted a resolution uh, expressing grave concern about Libya. The U.S. Senate then unanimously approved a resolution calling for the Security Council to impl uh, impose a no-fly zone over Libya, and by March the Security Council had authorized member states to use force to protect Libyan civilians, and the House, the U.S. House, started to have a dispute about what the President's constitutional obligations uh, and duties would be in response to this uh, international crisis. And on March 18th, with this dispute unresolved, President Obama deployed troops to Libya. Now this, the authority that the president used to deploy troops uh, drew from two separate sources. The first is the U.S. Constitution, which gives the president the power to command the military uh, and gives Congress the power to declare war. And then there's the War Powers Resolution of 1973, which creates uh, procedural and reporting requirements for troop deployments. And these procedural requirements in the, in the War Powers Resolution created some structured expectations about how the branches would respond to each other um, over time. And so when the U.S. operations continued past the time horizon that the WPR had set, without legislative authorization, members of Congress started to challenge President Obama's constitutional and statutory faithfulness. Obama's response to this moment was so interesting. Um, instead of either discontinuing operations or challenging the constitutionality of the War Powers Resolution, which many presidents have done, he argued that the deployments did not amount to hostilities or to war in the constitutional sense, he said. Um, and uh, the, the Congress basically accepted this, or at least refused to act decisively to um, rebut it. The House resolved that the Libyan mission had not been legislatively authorized and said that it had the prerogative to withdraw funding, but it didn't uh, do so. So many people expressed constitutional concerns, but nobody took decisive action to translate those concerns into res restrictions on what the president could do. Now this challenge, the legislature's challenge and the president's response, create a very revealing window into characteristic features of the war powers debate under the U.S. Constitution. And the first is, um, you know, the first piece to note is this debate over the meaning of hostilities um, and debate over the meaning of, of war. War and hostilities and police actions are not categories that are uh, just given to us. These are categories that are constructed in politics and the political branches have a stake in defining the content of these words because whether those words show up in constitutional language or in statutory language, there are matters of institutional empowerment at stake in the use of these words. Um, so the branches competed their, their institutional uh, debate into a, a linguistic debate, into a vocabulary debate. 
Um, this conflict was not judicialized in any way. Uh, members of the House did sue the President, um, but the U.S. District Court threw the case out and noted its frustration that Congress would even think to turn to the courts given long-standing precedent that this is a political question, not subject to legal, uh, legal review. And so the controversy, this constitutional controversy was decided through non-judicial politics, um, shot through with partisanship and with strategic reasoning. And the politics of the moment were on really vivid display when we saw three prominent executive branch officials, uh, Obama, Vice President Biden, and Secretary of State Clinton, all of whom were arguing that this use of the military in Libya was perfectly constitutional, um, not hostilities, but all of whom, when they were Democratic ch uh, senators challenging a Republican president, had emphasized the importance of legislative authorization for war. And these, these features of the debate are conditioned by a, by a broader constitutional context that has a few interesting and salient features, the reason why I chose the War Powers case to focus on. Um, and the first is that the Constitution, the U.S. Constitution, creates ambigu ambiguity over a primary question, which is which branch has the power to initiate hostilities. There is definitely a federal government empowered to wage war, um, but who can initiate? Congress can declare war. Is that a simple legal power to name hostilities as war, or does this represent an exclusive power to authorize all military confrontations? Um, and Congress has significant powers also to um, pass laws, appropriate funds, regulate the military, create the structure of the executive bureaucracy. Uh, Congress has also given the power to issue letters of mark and reprisal, which was a form of limited uh, undeclared war in the 18th century. Um, but the president has this very vague executive power, and the Constitution designates him uh, commander-in-chief when called into the service of the United States. And the presidency never adjourns. The structure of the branch is comparatively uh, efficient. Article, one, Article 2, Section 1 uh, requires the president to... Uh, swear to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution. And these features to many people imply some kind of independent war powers. Um, but the contours of those powers and the conditions under which they can be used are not textually specified. The democratic problem is especially acute because of the presidency is just one person, obviously. And the U.S. Constitution does not provide for one authoritative institution to settle this controversy. So the South African Constitution designates its constitutional court as the highest court on all constitutional matters, and then it specifies that the court will make a final decision whether a matter is a constitutional matter or not. So clear entrenchment of, of legal supremacy. The U.S. Constitution never concretely establishes judicial review in the first place, and uh, the power of the U.S. Supreme Court to interpret the Constitution is implied. Its origi origins rest in judicial constitutional reasoning that's been sustained by other actors. Um, and in their constructions, uh, judges have chosen to limit their scrutiny of political questions like what kinds of uh, procedures uh, are acceptable for going to war. So the, court, the Constitution and the court have stepped back. Uh, in the domain of war powers, the agents who have advanced and judged claims about war authority are not courts, but the elected branches themselves. And they've done so as they formulate and defend their policies to one another and to the electorate. They have done so in ways that are usually transparently linked to their institutional or partisan advantage. So whether in Libya or in Syria, um, the Obama administration has not been alone in its claims that it can act independently. Truman, Ford, Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, Reagan, George H.W. Bush, Clinton, and Obama all claimed the power to initiate hostilities without congressional authorization. Um, and presidents from Jefferson to Polk to Lincoln to Wilson have behaved as if congressional authorization is optional. And while George W. Bush is remembered for his bellicosity, his effort to get congressional authorization to fight the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan is actually kind of notable for its limited, um, limited claim and its sensitivity to legislative prerogatives in war. There are many U.S. presidents who have behaved as though engaging in hostilities is not a relevant question for Congress. Uh, Congress has been actively engaged in its own uh, behalf. Early Congresses uh, made assertions of constitutional authority that are really breathtaking to modern ears. So the f one of the first showdowns between the branches, the debate between Pacificus and Helvidius, con concerned whether or not it's constitutionally appropriate for the president to offer a point of view about how a treaty should be interpreted. And members of, of Congress thought that if the president said something about how he thought a treaty should be interpreted, that that would so distort the deliberative environment that the legislature faced that it would be basically usurping the legislature's um, uh, unique and sole authority over war. 
It's a vociferous debate. And many of Congress's esteemed members, the Senators Vandenberg, uh, Nye, Taft, Mansfield, Mansfield, and Fulbright, they have been known for their sustained challenges to war authority, executive war authority. And even today, um, debates over Libya and Syria have demonstrated that Congress has its, has its defenders, even in this age of the imperial presidency. So we have here an ongoing pattern of interpretive conflict between the branches about who has war authority, and in a context that doesn't intersect well with standard presumptions about the conditions for a faithful legal practice or a faithful constitutional interpretation. Because conventional beliefs about constitutional legal reasoning emphasize neutrality, they emphasize uh, impartial review, they emphasize the importance of making policy that conforms with the Constitution's procedural requirements as specified either in the text or through judicial construction. But here we have kind of vague, underdeterminate constitutional language. We have an interpretive process that's driven by um, the politics of motivated and strategic and partisan office holders. Uh, we have no final arbiter. Um, the, so the structural conditions of this war powers debate seem to be repugnant to very core conditions that are thought necessary for a faithful interpretive practice. And that's what lights me up. That's why I got so excited about, about this area of constitutional studies. Um, so what to do in this context? How do you think about faithfulness in a, in a context like war powers? And one idea is to, is to give up. So Mark Tushnet says, in the context like this, whatever the political process produces is constitutional. Whatever the branches do, there's no rules, there's no possibility of assessing or evaluating. They're just going to do what they do, and whatever that is, is constitutional. Um, but that's very unsatisfying to me, because war is so endemic in American political history. It's the major, it has been the major engine behind the development of the state, major costs in lives and treasure. And it seems odd to just throw up our hands and say the Constitution has nothing to say on this question of how we we summon this sovereign power. Okay, there's a dominant legal approach, uh, which is what I call a settlement model. And the settlement model says the point of a constitution is to resolve basic questions of institutional competence, um, like who gets to decide who goes to war. And so even though our constitution, the US constitution, doesn't seem to settle this question, even though there's no single empowered interpreter to enforce its understanding of the meaning of the Constitution, let's act as if that were the case. Um, let's act as if the Constitution does settle this. And settlement views then split into two camps, so pro-Congress settlement view and a pro-presidency settlement view, each of them claiming that the Constitution essentially resolves that their favored institution would be the authoritative institution uh, for going to war. And I call these insular views because each of these, this pro-Congress settlement view and this pro-executive settlement view, each try to protect its favored institution from having to justify its position to the rival branch um, and perhaps modify its position in return. Each emphasize the, um, the finality of the authority of, of, its, of its preferred institution. You know, the constitutional allocation of power is thought to speak for itself um, in some way. Um, Okay, so those, that, you know, these insular views basically just translate the dispute in politics between pro-Congress and pro-executive officials into a dispute in legal theory. What I try to achieve in my book, uh, I call a relational conception of war authority. And I start out by saying that this, this settlement view is insufficient and so too is this um, uh, anything goes view that, that Hushnet argues for. I say that establishing a stable or legal um, procedural framework is just one task of a constitution. Constitutions also create resources. They create textual resources, they create ideological resources, and they create institutional resources through which actors occupy various roles or offices and then in turn use those offices to advance their aims in politics. So the constitution creates a politics as much as it creates a legal order. And the availability of these textual, ideological, institutional resources for ordinary politics makes it appropriate to think about constitutional fidelity, not just in terms of respect for a legal framework, but also in terms of officials' relationship to a structured politics that is created and sustained with constitutional language and institutions. So what does that mean? Then how do we translate that into an assessment of which branch has authority to go to war? The book turns to, um, two categories, structure and substance. So instead of asking which branch has a war, has war authority, I say, let's ask, 
How can we assess the politics through which the branches produce new constructions of the Constitution's meaning on this question? How do we assess the politics by which the branches generate answers to the question of who has authority to take the country to war? And the first, my first answer is to turn to structure. So this is very familiar in constitutional theory um, that we would assess the sort of the ethics of official behavior by looking at the structure within which that, that official is, 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 is enacting power. So for example, the powers of legal institutions often generate the requirement that legal officials would reason in ways that are neutral, that bracket policy considerations and so forth. The structural position of the legal interpreter is thought to imply some ethical imperatives of how that power should be exercised. Well, I apply that same reasoning to the electoral branches. And I say, what are the structures that are distinctive to the elected branches? And what sorts of ethics of interpretation do these structures then imply? Uh, I argue that the Constitution structure gives the branches certain distinctive capacities, and that the more effectively they use these capacities to elaborate constitutional meaning, I argue, the more faithfully they are behaving. Okay, so the more faithfully they are behaving, the more they use their distinctive um, capacities to elaborate the Constitution's meaning in the context of their time. A second, I turn to substance. I say the Constitution establishes a set of, of goals. Um, so the preamble says that one point of the Constitution is to create a common defense or general welfare. Uh, the elected branches are governing bodies and they have the task of pursuing security among other political goods. And I think that generates a substantive consideration. The more effectively they pursue these constitutionally mandated goals, the more faithfully they are behaving, I argue. So a Congress whose deliberations on the war power are premised on a better understanding of the nation's core security interests is for that reason, I argue, doing a better job in its constitutional reasoning. And so on this basis, the structure and substance, I generate a set of standards for each branch for assessing their constitutional politics. And I argue that these standards are implicit in the Constitution's text and design, and that they can be applied to a range of um, policies and the reason-giving practices associated with those policies. I name them, in the book I name them, processualist standards. And this is a form of contextually situated critical evaluation for institutional performance. And so here are the processual standards I argue for for Congress. I say first that the legislature should be independent in its reasoning because of the independence of its political power. That the legislature draws political power from constituencies that are distinct than those of the president and so that it should use independent reasoning as to uh, the nature of, of goals that it's seeking um, or methods for seeking those goals. It shouldn't just replicate the reasoning of another branch. I argue that the legislature should engage in reasoning over public policy that's sensitive to the security realities it encounters, that it should be alert to the security realities in the world. I argue that the legislature should link its arguments about constitutional authority to its substantive agendas for security policy. And note, this is something we would never ask a court to do, to reason about constitutional authority in a way that is sensitive to the, what the court thinks the US role in NATO should be, for instance. But I say that Congress should do this. Uh, I ask that the legislature create and express divergent lines of reasoning on both policy and constitutional matters. This is um, manifesting the, the strength that legislatures have for, for showcasing pluralism um, and mobilizing pluralism. I ask that the, that the Congress should mobilize its skill in lawmaking and so thereby translate areas of political agreement into legal language, into statutory or treaty language that then can guide state officials or citizens. I say that Congress should advance the consensus politics of its electorate. That's a strength of legislatures. That Congress should use its ability to pool and weigh information from multiple sources and thereby generate large understandings of public policy on the basis of complex information. It should use its fact-finding capacities. And I argue that the Congress should advance its position in a way that's responsive to the position of the president. That it shouldn't just ignore what the president says but engage it because they're set into a system of, uh, of responsiveness. And for the presidency, a few of the standards that I argue for include, uh, first, that the president should be independent in its reasoning. Um, the presidency has independent powers and independent constituencies. Uh, that the president should reason in a way that's sensitive to the security realities that uh, he encounters. That the president should mobilize the consultative and intelligence resources of the executive branch, so use the information of the CIA, the National Security Council, the State Department, and so forth. 
that the president should seek to protect high priorities over low ones, respond flexibly to emerging threats, uh, that in his deliberations, the president should elevate subordinates who perform well and dismiss or marginalize those who do not perform well, so an effective use of hierarchy, which is a signal of the executive branch, and that the president should advance his position in a way that's responsive to the position of Congress. So these are the structural criteria that I generate. And these are not legal standards, obviously. We don't ask judges to reason about constitutional language in a way that's sensitive to policy tasks, in part because there's not reason for confidence that they would be good at developing policy in the first place. Um, we don't ask judges to mobilize pluralism or to reflect a broad consensus because the interpretation of the law is not supposed to be politically responsive in just that way. But I say the Constitution is not just law, it's also a set of ideological and institutional resources. So it's appropriate for the branches to use different forms of reasoning to cash out the meaning of this charter. Um, these standards also suggest that constitutionally faithful interpreters will change their understandings of key words over time. That there's not one fixed meaning of, say, war. And since security realities change, um, and these are proceduralist standards, their, their interpretations of what war means are going to change over time, and that's fine, I argue. So, you know, I say it's not just acceptable for the meaning of defense or war to change over time. It makes a lot of sense because our core security interests, the core security interests of any nation, change over time. And why should one meaning of defense be fixed into a context where it's no longer relevant? So the book has a chapter comparing Franklin Roosevelt in the lead up to World War II with President Polk in the lead up to the Mexican War. And the spoiler is that Roosevelt comes out better than Polk. And that argues um, that we can assess the politics behind the branch's effort to redefine the nature of war. In both Roosevelt's case and in Polk's case, the presidents were engaged in a battle to redefine how people understood of what a defensive war could be. And I argue that Roosevelt did a much better job um, than Polk. Um, these standards are also political. They're not just not legal, they're emphatically political in the sense that they demand substantive assessment of foreign policy aims. So for example, the demand that the legislature engage in reasoning over public policy that's sensitive to the security realities it encounters, well, we differ about the nature of the security realities that are around us. Not all of us see the same security realities. So for some, um, when Congress failed to consider the U.S.'s broader role in the Middle East, that would be a devastating criticism of its Iraq war authorization. But for others, Congress's willingness to support Bush's appeal reflects an appropriate, well-grounded judgment that strong security calls for an empowered presidency. So there's going to be different opinions on the question of whether security realities have been addressed by the legislature or not. Once someone, once one announces a set of standards that are sensitive to results-based reasoning and goal-driven behavior, those standards cannot but be subject to controversy in their application. So in the condition, so in normal conditions of politics, which is empirical uncertainty, pluralism, and so on, we can expect that applying these standards will develop, um, will be sensitive to partisan, other forms of affiliated reasoning, that there will be controversy over these standards. And I argue in the book that that's not a problem, that constitutional theory does not need to produce answers that everyone can adhere to, either at the level of theory or at the level of practice. We don't need to settle this question at the level of theory or practice. It's more important, I say, to do a good job than it is to resolve controversy. And I call this a relational account of war authority. So the book argues for this theory, and then it tries to show that the theory can be useful in, in um, assessing actual politics. So I have a series of case studies um, that use it to, to show how an assessment would take place under these standards. And to show that this model lets us accommodate intuitions about constitutional authority that settlement models don't provide for and gives us traction on controversies that legal literatures are going to, um, to ignore. So for example, this, this model of constitutional authority um, lets us accommodate some very common intuitions about political performance that are hard to understand otherwise. So for example, the difference between um, President Kennedy's handling of the Cuban Missile Crisis and Nixon's Cambodian incursion. Both of these not authorized by, by statutory law. Neither were, were legal authorized. Both were pursuant to grand ideological aims of the Cold War. Um, so le legally speaking, these two cases sh should be parallel. If Kennedy, if it was okay for Kennedy to, um, you know, to get to take us to the brink of war for the Cuban Missile Crisis, then it should be all right for Nixon to bring troops into Cambodia unauthorized. Um, but 
one, the Kennedy case, is a classic case study of presidential excellence, and the other was listed as an impeachable offense in early drafts of impeachment articles against Nixon. So the political response to these two uh, legally, except, apparently acceptable deployments of power is, is very different. And in chapter four I show that the relational conception of war powers that I argue for can track this, this intuition that the two are actually very different cases and, um, and it does so by pointing to institutional performance and by looking at the role of the, pre the way that the institution was performing um, in order to generate its judgment that this was an authorized intervention or not in the first place. Or another example is the Iraq and Afghanistan wars. When I started writing this book, people would say, oh, well, this is obviously going to be a book about all the constitutional deficiencies associated with the Iraq and Afghanistan wars. And there's very few, from a legal point of view, a question of committing forces, there's, there's no legal deficiencies because both of these were properly authorized by Congress. And yet there's a widespread perception that there was something constitutionally deficient in that process, a common intuition of, of a problem. Um, even though both were legally authorized. And my book uh, can explain that. If you think that there was insufficient deliberation and that deliberation is part of, of developing a, a responsible constitutional judgment, then the resources of this book can explain that intuition. Um, the book, the, the relational conception also allows us to reframe ongoing war powers controversies. So in the chapter on the Cold War, the US, the US launching of the Cold War, when we note that Congress didn't authorize the Korean War, which was the threshold moment for the entry um, into the imperial presidency of the 20th century and the pivot of the contemporary war powers debate, to note that Congress didn't legally authorize the war in Korea is really just, just the beginning. What do we do about the fact that Congress was working to invite active unilateral presidentialism, that Congress was highly mobilized towards collective security, that the Senate Foreign Relations Committee Chair Tom Connolly advised Truman not to seek legislative authorization, um, but that Congress failed to translate that apparently political consensus on behalf of an empowered presidency into legal language. What do we do with that fact? And I argue, and this chapter is a very controversial chapter in the book, I argue that Congress constructed a politics but not a legal architecture that broadened the meaning of the president's defense of war powers. And then I say that that politics can be assessed, even though it failed to deliver the kind of law that traditional war powers theorists would like to see. Um, and it can especially be assessed because this is not the first time that Congress has done this, that under Theodore Roosevelt, uh, Congress participated in generating the Roosevelt Corollary, which also allowed for independent presidential strikes um, in South America, in Central America, Caribbean. And that when we compare these two moments, the creation of the Cold War order and the creation of the Roosevelt Corollary, we see that actually early Cold War Congresses did a pretty good job. They were certainly better than the Roosevelt Corollary Congresses. They were more deliberative, they were more inclusive, they were more responsive to challenge, there was more mobilized constitutional challenge. I mean, this was in large part because of the role of Republicans conservatives, um, the Taft conservatives and the Breiker wing of the Republican Party who brought controversy associated with the Cold War into focus. Um, you know, this is a controversial chapter. I think controversy is going to remain over the Cold War, over Iran-Contra, over U.S. entry into World War II. The controversy will remain over war powers questions long after my book is read. The point of the relational conception is not to resolve that controversy, but to focus it, not just on questions of legal authorization, but on questions of institutional performance. So the book is speaking with two voices at the same time. On the one hand, it's trying to show that we can use this theory in order to generate conclusions uh, about, about particular policy disputes. And on the other hand, it's trying to show that this framework itself represents a challenge to traditional ideas about, about legal authority, traditional ideas about what constitutional authority in general um, consists of, and especially the role of, of pluralism and conflict uh, in those notions. Okay, that's it. That's the end for me. Thank you. Are there any questions? Yes. You mentioned that uh, if war authority is all about politics, did, in your research, did you find any discrepancies between whether or not um, the debate differed, depending whether the presidency or the, the political party of the presidency was the same as the majority of Congress, um, or if it was different? Well, so, okay, so from a large, you know, people who do large end studies of these questions, it looks very clear that there's more challenge to the presidency when an el the opposing party holds power over Congress. There's, the presidency will have more investigations, the presidency will have 
more restrictions, the presidency will have more challenges in doing, generally speaking, more challenges in what he wants to do when an opposing member of Congress controls, controls con uh, opposing party controls Congress. Um, at the level of the particular, like at the level, at the case study level that I was working at, I actually didn't see strong evidence of, um, I saw partisanship being very, very important, but not important in the sense that presidents with opposing partisanship were more tightly restricted and those with the same partisanship were less tightly restricted. So the, the, the people who were so active in uh, limiting for, for good or ill presidentialism in the early Cold War context were Republicans, conservative Republicans, and they were perfectly willing to challenge both Truman and Eisenhower. Uh, they were vociferous in both cases. Or in Vietnam, you know, the, the, the response to Vietnam you know, obviously took off once you had a Democratic Congress and a Republican president, but it started, the Fulbright, the Fulbright investigations started with a Democratic senator investigating a Democratic president. So in the cases that I found, I found, I found a lot of ways in which you need partisanship in order to explain what particular actors are doing, but it doesn't line up in this neat way such that opposing parties always generate more limitations. And I'm not sure if it's just particular cases that I chose or what? <laughs> I think there's just a variety of mechanisms. You know, if you think about partisanship, one reason that there would be more contestation would be uh, because the, the, the opposing party has an incentive to embarrass the president. But people within the same party can also have an incentive to try to displace the president in their quest for power. And so especially in the Senate, you'll have in-party members who are seeking to enhance their you know, prospects with wings of their party by challenging a president of their own party. So that's another vehicle through which challenge can happen. Yeah. Yes. Uh, did you look in your research at uh, in any other jurisdictions or draw any conclusions, for example, from parliamentary systems like Canada? Was there in the crown prerogative and and, yeah. and and the prime minister's relationship with parliament and things like that? Well, I didn't in my research, but it's actually something that you know I would be interested in hearing your thoughts about or in talking about a little bit because it seems you know I thought in the I thought it's unsettled in Canada. What, what are we talking about in in the Canadian context explicitly? And it looks from a legal point of view, it looks very settled that it's the cabinet that has the power to authorize hostilities, but from a practice point of view, that seems a little bit less clear, and I guess it depends on where you identify the Constitution, the level of practice or, or at the level of text. So I actually would be curious to hear, hear your thoughts on whether you see this as a, as a settled phenomenon or um, a contested one. <laughs> <laughs> I have another question. Sure. Uh, yeah. Did you, you well, I guess, I, I guess, and I'm not the expert, I, I, I would defer to Colonel Bolt has actually written a little bit on this, and, and Professor Lagasse as well, uh, who, who's, who's studied a lot about the, the Crown prerogative and the, and the war powers. Mm -hmm. uh, but obviously, you know, there's things you read in the media, there's certain parliamentary practice that you see uh, that may not necessarily be consistent with the, with the legal framework that we have in Canada and mm -hmm. previous practice, and the, the Parliament's actually done quite an extensive study of, of deployment of the Canadian forces. In, in situations and, and where there's been parliamentary devo uh, votes or take note debates or things like that. So it's just, I, I haven't studied it extensively. I just know that it's, uh, we do things quite differently, but, but the same sort of issues are, are, are alive and well in Canada. It's just that the approach may be a little bit uh, different. But anyway, there may be some fruit there for further research for you. Yeah, and, the, and I'll say that where my interest in, in pluralism and especially institutionally situated pluralism was generated from was from reading about the Yugoslav experience and the way that poorly constitutionalizing pluralism can, you know, I was very fat in the US Civil War, I'm very fascinated in the difference between institutionalized pluralism that results in a breakdown and institutionalized pluralism that creates policy creativity, that generates accountability, that generates, you know, solid constitutional practices. So it's not a place I've taken it to yet, but it's an interest. Yeah. Maybe, well, uh, maybe just following up on that uh, issue. I mean, in Canada, I think one way of looking at what has been happening is they, uh, is it's a, uh, there's a concern between the discrepancy or the differences between constitutionality and democratic legitimacy. Mm -hmm. And settled interpretation of constitutional law, I would argue, may, may not actually yield 
answers that are in tune with contemporary expectations of democratic legitimacy. So I don't know if this is relevant in the context of what you were doing, but I mean, that'd be one way of looking at this. My question was more um, whether uh, it would be fair to say that your view uh, seems in practice to be largely uh, convenient or favorable to the executive branch. Because in practice, the executive engages in hostilities and deploys troops, and then Congress can complain about it and claim it's illegitimate or illegal. or uh, And then if the normative um, framework to assess uh, the legitimacy of the situation or the constitutionality of the, of the situation is to examine the kind of arguments put forward, whether, whether there was engagement or not, and, and things like that, then, you know, in a way, it's it, uh, in terms of uh, judging the the constitutional appropriateness of the of the action, it uh, you know, it seems uh, to be quite easy for the executive to get away with pretty much anything. Mm -hmm. But maybe I'm just trying to be a bit more provocative here. But it seems to me that see, it it ends with a uh, a largely uh, pro executive. Um, Right. Bias. Right. <laughs> well, so so I think that it's globalism that creates that m m more than say my theory. And so, so, you know, if you think about in the Canadian context and in the U.S. context, this dis dispute about the democratic legitimacy of processes for going to war, and then what's the countervailing argument? Generally, today the countervailing argument is well, there are treaty requirements that require us to mobilize. You know, no matter what our constituencies think about it, once you've signed on to NATO, once you've once you've made certain commitments, those commitments are binding, and um, and that's a feature of of globalism. I mean, that's a feature of global governance and the effort to to integrate um, different sources of sovereignty. So, in the cases that I look at, I think you can say yes, this favors the presidency, except that we need to step back and think about which institution is and is not the first mover. So one of the key cases in the U.S. context that people use to talk about the presidency's advantage is, is the Cold War and the way that the Cold War licensed or authorized presidential strikes with, with then Congress sort of put to this after-the-fact role of either, you know, approving it or, or not after the fact, after everything had been, had been wrapped up. But Congress was very active in constructing the state capacity and the ideology that underpinned the Cold War. I mean, Congress was not just a passive victim of a Cold War mania. Congress participated in developing this ideology. Congress was, was vociferous in making Truman, uh, fo f emphasizing a focus, for example, on Asia instead of a focus on Europe. So Congress has been very active in creating the ideological basis from which then independent presidentialism uh, emerges. And that politics, it, so part of the plea of the book is to say, take that politics seriously as a constitutional politics, that creating an ideological, um, the, the, the way that, that a legislature affects the way that we conceive our security from an ideological point of view, our ideologies of security, the role that a legislature has in doing that is highly consequential for what kinds of behaviors it makes sense for a president to um, to embark on, and and that's a moment of constitutional agency, and that's a place where Congress has not, you know, Congress members have not been, uh, legislators have not been willing to accept the, the, those implications, have been very eager to paint themselves as victims of a of an executive branch that has that has stolen power, even though they themselves may have participated in creating the, the conditions within which that steel made sense. So I definitely see that in the Cold War. Mm. Um, <clears throat> I wonder if I could just pick up on that idea and the, the, the one that trailed it and just ask you uh, flat out, this is I, I think two different questions. First off, whether you think that uh, it would be better uh, just generally, if Congress approved um, wars or the U.S. involvement in wars, and then if you take the same question but strip away all the political uh, aspects of it, so it's simply whether a, dis a better decision will be made if Congress um, made the decision on its own. So that would be my, my first uh, question for you. The, the second is a little bit, um, it's on a, a slightly different area, and that's um, it, the, the focus here on constitutionality seems to be on domestic uh, issues. I'm wondering if, or did your book look at international law mm -hmm. issues? So when you bring up Cambodia, 
uh, versus Cuban Missile Crisis or Afghanistan versus Iraq, the first thing that comes to mind for me is the international legal uh, legitimacy of those, of those conflicts. So can we say that uh, part of the constitutionality question, in fact, engages the international law issue? And in fact, <clears throat> it's not that there wasn't enough discussion between Congress and, and the executive in that case, in those cases. It's just that in one case it was legal internationally and, and the other perhaps it wasn't. Um, so I don't think international law, okay, international law can replicate some of the problems that domestic law can, you know, okay, so the book doesn't take up international law except insofar as the political actors, the domestic actors themselves take up international law. So it's always through the voice of actors who are making claims about international law in order to advance their own claims in politics. That's the way international law comes in, in the book. Um, you know, without an, inter without an enforcer of international law against the United States, it's unclear what the practical consequence is of arguing that this is a violation of international, you know, it, it requires agents on the ground to be making it relevant in order for it to be relevant. And that's obviously varies a lot in different contexts. What I'm working on now, the project that I'm working on now is much more connected to your question in that I'm, I'm thinking about um, the role of, of global governance in transforming the nature of these constitutional issues. So what does it mean that the pre so I argue, the president has developed new capacities since the presidency was created in the first constitution. The, the presidency now has a, a capacity to act as a kind of global representative, um, as, a, as a diplomat that has global responsibilities and responsibilities to global constituencies, not just U.S. constituencies given U.S. power. And what kinds of, um, how does that reshape the constitution, domestic constitutional dilemmas that the president faces. I think that it should reshape them, but I don't know how. So my next book is <laughs> argue or think through not just the question of international law, but the question of global governance more broadly and global responsibilities more broadly, both political responsibilities and legal responsibilities. And to say you can't look at the US constitution anymore as just this insular document of one country that when the US is exercising so much um, he hegemonic, dare I say, power, that uh, responsibility to global constituencies becomes much more important and needs to be theorized as part of, it, right alongside of a, of a domestic practice. But this book doesn't do that. It just, yeah. And then on Congress, I don't, I don't know what I think. I don't think necessarily this is a very good war power system that the U.S. Constitution creates. I think my interpretation of it is a really good interpretation and would generate better outcomes, I think, than, um, than settlement models and at least, at least clarify what we're doing when we make these arguments in, in politics. But, um, you know, and in general, as a Democrat, I have a preference for legislative empowerment. Um, but, you know, obviously the legislature hasn't always performed very well, and neither has the president. So I, I, don't, I wouldn't feel comfortable saying, oh, yes, I really think Congress would do a much better job. It's very clear to me that this institution is the institution that can handle it. I think there's obvious reasons why Congress hasn't been given all authority over all uh, military questions. Um, so. Thanks. Uh, one comment and one question. On the parliamentary system analogy, it seems to me the uh, events in the UK in the last, over the Syrian mm -hmm. uh, yes. uh, conflict come into play, where the Cameron government uh, sought parliamentary approval, didn't get it, and there was a big debate about whether democratic legitimacy or constitutional power was in play. Anyway, that's just a, an interesting contemporary yeah. hot topic. And so for me, this, so the Syria debate, so, you know, this was so oh, tragic for the people of Syria, but so useful for my research purposes because, um, so look at what happened. You know, Obama creates this red line of chemical weapons, that if chemical weapons are used, he's going to, you know, commit forces. Uh, and then that red line is crossed. And then, and, you know, and then in the UK, it sort of casts doubt on the question of, of, of executive uh, entrenchment, of, uh, deployment of forces. And there's this constitutional question that's raised. And, and Obama starts to being mocked and, and sort of ridiculed for his, for his wavering, um, you know, waffly position on, the, on, the, on this question of war powers. And as this dispute is playing out between the branches, there's this, t I mean, it looks to me as an outside observer that time was created for a diplomatic resolution to, uh, to take place. And so we never needed to answer the ultimate question of whether Obama would have the authority to commit troops on his own because a diplomatic process was, was achieved that would have been very hard to achieve um, without 
the time that was introduced by the constitutional ambiguity. On the other hand, that outcome would also have been very difficult to achieve had it not been for the, you know, the jump, the electrification of the process that happens when the president does lay down a red line. So to me, this was an example of a place where ambiguity had fruitful international outcomes, where being able to say on the one hand, there's a red line, and on the other hand, oh wait, we're not really sure if there is a red line or not, we need to step back and have some debate about that on the one hand, sort of jolted a process into motion, and then on the other hand, created time for that process to unfold. So to me, this was a place where constitutional ambiguity generated positive policy results. And it's sort of a counter, you know, counter example to the argument that constitutions must authoritatively resolve these questions in a clear and transparent way for all contexts. Well, thanks. Uh, my question, you, your reference to the Cuban Missile Crisis mm -hmm. brought to mind um, the work of Gary Wills a few years ago, mm -hmm. who argued that the emergence of this nuclear fact of the hot button of instantaneous conflict emerging in the Cold War just uh, blew away any question or uh, possible debate between Congress and the executive branch, given the fact that the president's fingers on the button. and. He interpreted, as I remember, Congress as being completely supine, uh, the way he described it, um, in the face of this new nuclear technology fact. Um, what, 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 how, how does the nuclear um, quick response need uh, fit into your story of uh, well, the construction that each branch has of its own role and responsibility. Yeah, so, so you know, similar, similar to this question about the imperial presidency, the, in the moment, Congress was, to, you know, totally out of the loop. He, they weren't being consulted, they weren't being, but his, but Kennedy's concern about Cuba was very much driven by what was happening in Congress. I mean, Congress was making Cuba very much a priority for Kennedy, and Kennedy's worry about what the Republican, about the way that the Republicans in Congress were going to be challenging him for not being aggressive enough on Congress. His his worry about, you know, everything that had gone wrong in Bay of Pigs, which itself was initiated by concerns in Congress you know, was, was, was heavily conditioning the context within which these choices were being made. So to say Congress had nothing to do with the Cuban Missile Crisis, I think is just wrong when this focus on, on, con on Cuba as being a, a location of threat to the United States, a location of vulnerability, that it being absolutely unacceptable for, for Cuba to be uh, empowered in any way, that was emanating from Congress. So I think to write that out of the picture is to give an incomplete portrait of how the interaction between the branches produced a moment. Yes, at the moment where we've got a possible nuclear confrontation, they were not involved. But creating the context that made it such that putting those missiles in Cuba meant getting to a point of nuclear confrontation, Congress was deeply involved in, in that. Yeah. yeah, just following up uh, that particular point, in fact, the the role of Congress in initiating. Can you can you apply your theory or some of your research to this current <clears throat> conflict between Congress and the President over Iran, wherein Congress, by passing such strict sanctions legislation, and um, which included, I think, language that said that if if the threat continued or if uh, a settlement was not made, and if Israel went to war. Uh, the U.S. would follow. Um, and then it invoked the response from Senator Feinstein, I believe, saying that this would put Israel, uh, U.S. policy, the beck and call of Israel, and then there was a counter reaction to that. I mean, this, this seems to be a case, this current conflict, where uh, in fact Congress is moving, or elements in Congress are moving more towards uh, War than the, than the president would like, and maybe your maybe your theory sort of applies in the reverse in this in this case. Yeah, well, I don't, you know. So one of the reasons that I pause about the question of is legislative governance better is because one of the things that shows up very clearly in the cases is that Congresses can be very very bellicose, and Congresses have often pushed presidents towards war. Um, you know, there are clear cases in the U.S. imperial, con you know, in the late 19th century, early 20th century, Congress was out there telling the president, you know, takes in Panama, you know inviting the president to, to get involved in Panama, inviting the president to seize property that, that members of Congress thought would be useful for one purpose or another, it, emphasizing the importance of a strong defense posture in, in the Caribbean and so forth. And, and in the Cold War, uh, similar, and today in Iran, similar. So it's not, it's very convenient for Congress to say that this power has been usurped if a president then goes to war on his own initiative. But when, when, when Congress, uh, 
is, is bellicose in this way, to me, I would say they're exercising constitutional agency. They're creating a politics that generates constitutional authority for the president, and they should be accountable for, for that use of power. Um, I guess there were sim similar pressures in, in events in Canada-U.S. relations, such as 54-40 or fight, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. some of the... Uh, <clears throat> At the post-Civil War demands for, you know, uh, within Congress perhaps for uh, a more aggressive manifest destiny policy. Mm -hmm. Those would be examples where, mm -hmm. uh, where Congress also played a, a leading role and uh, resulted in a, a certain kind of response. Uh, in the case of uh, 5440 or fight, I guess it was uh, the, the Oregon Treaty of, which established the 49th parallel and uh, as the uh, as the border, but there were con probably more pres more congressional pressures and presidential pressures in that case to uh, to go to war. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is definitely a misunderstanding to see legislature as the more pacific institution. I think. So I don't know where this uh, where this goes, but just uh, following up on on questions about democratic legitimacy versus constitutional legitimacy, it sounds a little bit like what you're after, um, and uh, uh, that th what you're after sort of presses on that distinction in the first place. So once we give up the idea that a constitution is something which is uh, which is written and you know purely written and purely fixed uh, the the, uh, the that a certain element of democratic legitimacy can come out of the the, the play of the constitution mm -hmm. uh, so that the so so that the way in which we're accustomed uh, up here and I think you know, to an extent down there as well, to talk about these two things, democratic legitimacy and uh, and the Constitution as as uh, pressing against each other, that your uh, your way of looking at things shows how perhaps that that distinction is is overdrawn. Would that be a, a fair, uh, and, and that maybe it gives us a different way to look at the debate in Britain, for example. Is mm -hmm. that fair to say, or? Mm -hmm. I don't think, you know, but so it's not, a, so it's more about fixedness than it is textual or, or not textual, because my argument is that this is all in the text. You know, this, I don't see it as a non-textual argument. I see it as a textual argument. It's just that the text is indeterminate. And then what processes do you use to generate content for indeterminate text? And yes. And those so process, processes can potentially be um, uh, subject to democratic legitimization. Right, but then, but the democratic question is going to recur no matter which is, because if you say, okay, well then judges are going to be the ones who are going to be implementing this definite text, then you have this democratic authority of judges you want to look at. But even in my account, if you have competing institutions that are, you know, battling with one another in order to generate content, I haven't given a democrat, I haven't given a democratic defense of that. You would then need to make the further argument that those institutions are democratic institutions and that the outcome of the conflict between them can be be demo, you know, and I don't make that argument, so I wouldn't say yes. I, okay. you know, stand in that, you know. But it, you know, so the questions are going to recur no matter what the what the kind of institutional processes are that generate content um, for that language. Um, but I think in a more interesting way, maybe than just the judicial hierarchy. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Thanks very much. I've done some some work on the on the Canadian case, and um, I just want to throw this out there to see if there's some generalizability to it. Um, one of the the arguments I've made with respect to the Canadian case is that when we see the legislature and the executive actively cooperating um, to instigate a conflict, we should be worried uh, because when they are no longer in in a situation to, to be in a conflictual setup, which mm -hmm. is institutionally designed to try and check one another and prevent uh, abuses of power. Um, when they cooperate, each for their own purposes, uh, does it reduce our ability to have an understanding of who's ultimately responsible for the decision? And does it allow them, I'll use the Canadian case in particular, it allows Parliament to say that it's given democratic legitimacy to something while it allows the executive to essentially launder its power through the legislature and not have to uh, answer for its decision. So are there any instances you can think of where when Congress and, and the President, and I'll maybe Syria is a good case, where they actively go out of their way to cooperate on an issue, we should be a little as scared as when 
they really are in, in conflict because when they cooperate, maybe they're not always doing it for uh, the, the most benign reasons. Mm -hmm. So the, you know, that really hits to the center of the work that I'm trying to create. So on the one hand, I, in, the, in the talk, I set up my opposition to the settlement model, to this, to this idea that the, that the language should be determinate, that there should be a single interpreter and so on. There is kind of an anti-settlement model out there, a, a destabilization model, which argues something like what you put on the table, that, that it's better for there to be conflict, that we should be worried when the institutions agree, that it's better for there to, that there's going to be more accountability, perhaps more participation, more inclusivity of processes and so forth if there's entrenched conflict. And it's precisely the, the, the absence of conflict that should give us grounds for worry. And I reject that model also, um, because I think that in certain contexts there are good reasons, there may be good reason, very good reasons for going to war. And if there are very good reasons to go to war, and those reasons are ascertainable from multiple different perspectives, such that folks agree and then are willing to mobilize their resources in order to go to war, I don't see a, re, a prima facie reason to have a problem with that. So, you know, so it's not an account that's trying to restrict how much we would go to war. That's try it doesn't. There's no particular value built into this about whether it's a good thing to go to war or a good thing not to go to war or a good thing to have conflict or to not have conflict. The point is to intelligently deploy these capacities. And so if war is an intelligent answer to a particular dilemma, then I think it would be a problem for a constitution to block that option. Um, and so the instance that has, I think, so profoundly affected 20th century practice is, is the World War II context where you have Congress so oppositional to Roosevelt and so unwilling to allow Roosevelt to enter World War II and really, you know, took us right up into the edge where if we, you know, if we had waited much, you know, if there hadn't been an attack and so forth, if, if things had gone much longer, really the, the ability to, to save Europe would have been uh, jeopardized. And Congress's awareness of its institutional performance in that moment, I think, did so much for why Congress was willing to write itself out of the picture in the Cold War and say, we don't trust ourselves with these questions, we're going to allow the executive branch. And, and that, I think, was a mistake. But the, the terror of a war that calls for a response and institutions unable to deliver that response because they're caught up in uh, worries about an imperial presidency that uh, is a worry that's very remote compared to the threat that's, that's coming from abroad, that's a real danger as well. And and constitution should be written in order to address that possibility. So, yeah. well, if there, if there are no other questions, then please uh, join me in thanking Professor Zeisberg for sharing her ideas with us today. And uh, yes, please join me. Thank you. Thank you. All. Thank you.